Hey, Ron. Well, now you don't know those It's funny. Good evening, Mingo. Good evening. So good to see you tonight. Good evening, Mingo family and friends who are with us via our live stream. So glad you could join us in our lovely fellowship hall for our uh, Bible study and uh, prayer meeting time tonight. Before we get started, let me remind everyone that we are collecting the items for the Falcon Children's Hall. Uh, items that kids will use 
uh, primarily in the bathroom, but uh, let me start over again, okay? Right. Forgot to turn my mic on. Although I've been called the fellow who does not need a microphone, but I understand that my voice only goes so far. It won't go through those wires without a little help. Uh, we're collecting items for the uh, Falcons Children's Home for the kids there, either in the uh, kitchen or the uh, bathroom. We see uh, things to wash clothes with, things to brush teeth with, things to wipe up with. And so we want to support this wonderful ministry at the Falcons Children Home. And at the same time, we continue to support our North Carolina Baptist Children's Home. We are collecting the gift cards from Food Lion, other stores that we'll give to the uh, children's homes and then they'll go out and purchase the items that they need. So we're holding these up and uh, we appreciate your taking your time to do those things. Also want to remind everyone we're going to do Mingo Bingo here at the church tomorrow from 2 till 4. And this coming Sunday from 2 to 3.30, got a uh, baby shower for uh, Cali Parish. And there's one more baby shower coming up, isn't there? Uh, Hillary. Yes, for Hillary McCullen. The 28th. The 28th. Hillary McCullen's. Or the 27th. 28th. 28th. Okay. Hillary McCullen, and so do we know what Cat, uh, Callie's having, boy or girl? Girl. girl? girl. A girl? What about Hillary? Do we know? Boy. Hillary's having a little boy. Callie's got a little girl. Okay. All right. So, want to support uh, these families and their excitement about a baby coming. So, please keep those in mind, and we'll also uh, share with you that not this coming Sunday. But Sunday the uh, 28th, we will also be doing a baptism as a part of our morning worship service. So on Sunday morning, April the 28th, uh, we'll be baptizing one into our church fellowship. Now, we want to conclude our study. We started uh, several weeks ago. I was hoping to get it concluded before uh, Easter, but I did not. We are looking at the seven miracles, not that they're uh, only seven miracles, but seven specifically mentioned miracles in the Gospel of John we call the Book of Signs. John's Gospel sets out different from the first three, the synoptics, which showed us Jesus coming into the world and then at the conclusion with the cross and the resurrection it is discovered or said that he is the Son of God. John's Gospel goes about it just the other way around. Right off the bat, he boldly declares that Jesus is the Son of God and by believing in him we might have eternal life. And stated his premise, he takes the Gospel to back up his claims and one of the ways he does it is with uh, mentioning these seven uh, miracles that we call seven signs. It says... I read something the other day I thought was very, very good. It says, John's goal was to lead the reader, particularly people from a Jewish background, to the realization that Jesus was, beyond any conceivable doubt, the perfect fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Each of the seven signs play a crucial role in helping one to reach the conclusion that he is the Son of God. That's a great statement. And John's gospel chooses these because anyone who has an understanding, especially of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, knows that the Messiah, the Son of God, will be the fulfillment of all these. And John says his doing these miracles confirm that. Now, the first sign John uh, shared with us was in the second chapter. And we read the story of Jesus turning water into wine. The second one was in the fourth chapter where Jesus heals the noble or the official that worked for the king, healed his son. The third sign was the man who had been laying by the, uh, the pool all of this for 38 years and Jesus healed the man at the pool. The fourth sign was the sign of Jesus feeding the 5,000 in John chapter 6. 
Also in John chapter 6, the fifth sign, which was Jesus walking on water. The sixth sign comes from John chapter 9, and that's where Jesus healed the man who had been blind since birth. We come to the seventh one tonight. In John chapter 11, a little more information is shared in this chapter. So we're looking in John chapter uh, 11 tonight. Let's look at that. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but what? For the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. John is showing us this in this sign. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, will he recover? Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, hold right there just a minute. Here's a great illustration of something the Bible does. And this is a clear, clear uh, indication. Many times the Bible speaks of truths, but it speaks of them in metaphors or euphemisms. Like uh, we've talked about before, the Bible calling death sleep. It is a euphemism as a point of understanding. But in this case, the disciples misunderstand what Jesus says about Lazarus. Though Jesus just comes out, point blank, says he's dead. He's dead. All right, verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that, what? You, may believe. you might believe, but let us go to him. Now understand the uh, powerful, powerful statement Jesus is making to these 12 disciples and oftentimes in our life, in the events of our lives, similar. Um, there are things that God permits in our lives. Many times difficult, unpleasant, hard to deal with, hard to comprehend. And we want God to swoop in, make everything right, remove all our troubles, all our problems, and just set things up so I could go back on my merry little way. But he does not do that. There's a reason why. And Jesus says it pretty point blank here. I'm glad for your sakes that God didn't just come along and automatically remove the thing that was disturbing you because if he had, you would have remained unchanged, unaffected, and continue on a way that might have been leading you away from God and his will. 
But Jesus said this, there's a reason things don't always go the way we think they should go. And what is the end of that? That we may believe. That we may believe. That life doesn't go the way I want it to go, but it will go the way God calls it to go, and that will be what's best for me. Verse 16. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we might die with him. Now what is he talking about there? <clears throat> what is Thomas saying there? He's been a little bit sarcastic here, but he's got a pretty good handle on something. What does Thomas mean? All right, let's go. So it won't be Lazarus that's the only one dead. will be dead. At this point, the Pharisees are actively, actively putting together a plan that will result in the death of Jesus. We had just read, Jesus looks at his disciples. We're going back to Judea. And they said, we just got out of there by the skin of our teeth, we're fortunate to be alive and you want us to go back there? And when it becomes clear that they are, Thomas not fully grasping what's going on, says, okay, boys, let's go. Write your dear John letter, get your, your affairs in order because obviously we're not coming back. We're not coming back. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead and in the tomb. How long? Four days. Four days. Verse 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. And this is, hang on there just a second. This is something else I deeply appreciate the scripture pointing out. When death comes to a family and grief sets in, and that's what's going on here. Mary and Martha are grieving uh, the death of their brother. And people are looking at them and they're looking at the way they respond or express their grief. And sometimes we think people ought to grieve in a certain way or in a certain fashion that everyone's going to grieve the same way. Is that true? No. No. One thing I learned as a young pastor was people will grieve and respond to death in a way that is personal to them and don't try to figure it out or don't judge one person's grieving by the way another person is grieving. What happens here? Martha does what? Martha did what? Runs out, runs out of the house, runs out to meet Jesus. What does Mary do? Sits but I wonder if anybody say, why is that Mary staying in the house? Martha's out there. Why isn't she out there? And you know, we can't hold people up to a standard that might be our standard or the way things ought to happen. Uh, I don't know about Pastor Lewis, but my wife will ask me from time to time to time, why people do certain things? And you know what the answer is? I don't know. They're people. And one thing I have discovered, not, about, not everyone thinks the way I think. Not everyone responds the way I respond. And I'm not the standard of normalcy. I hope y'all know that. I am not the standard of what is normal. I hope I do come close from time to time, but I'm not the standard. Here, Martha goes running out. Mary stays in the house, verse 21. Martha then said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, what? My brother would have not this is accusatory. 
This is accusatory. Lord, we sent you word. And if you'd have been here, my brother would be alive right now. What's coming out in her, do you think? Anger. Anger, exactly. Anger is an expression of grief. You've heard about those five stages. I wish I knew them all. I should have written them down. But one of the stages is denial, then anger. And you know, you're familiar with that. Well, the anger is coming out in Martha right here, verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, once again, she's coming close here. But she wants her brother alive on her terms. She wants her brother alive on her terms. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, now I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now notice how her mind is working. She wants her brother alive right now. And Jesus tells her, point blank, your brother's going to rise again. And she thinks he's giving her the rabbi dodge. She thinks he's giving her, well, you know, one day we're all guaranteed a resurrection. And one day we all will rise and she responds, Lord, I know that in the end there's going to be a resurrection and it's going to be lovely and wonderful. But you know, that's just so far off. It's hard for me to see that, what's going on. Then verse 25. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, what? I am, the resurrection. I am the resurrection. You're looking for an event instead of a person and that person is standing right in front of you. I'm the resurrection. Your brother's dead, but what? I'm life. Powerful statement. He who believes in me. He who believes in me. No matter what the circumstances say, no matter what my feelings may be saying to me right now, he that believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then the great question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you, are the, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. What a powerful confession of faith. John is showing us through a real life situation the point that God wants every human being to come to, to say, yes, God, I believe that your son is the Christ, the Messiah sent into the world. And I believe you sent him. And in him we have eternal life. That's the goal. That's the goal. Not just to heal me of my sickness. Not just to take away this painful situation. Not that they're not important. But what would have happened if Jesus had rearranged their world so they would have been happy again. That happiness would have been what? Temporary. Because no matter when it comes, the great enemy of humankind is death. And Jesus wants her to see. Only he has the power to defeat death. And it appears that her brother is the victim of death. And Jesus is showing her that because of her brother's belief in him, he is going to be the winner in this situation. Verse 28. When she said this, she went away and called who? Mary. Mary. <laughs> Saying what? The teacher's here. Saying how? Saying 
Secretly. Secretly. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. I, I like this. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister. Now, notice this. I like this. I love the little nuances of the scriptures. She didn't burst into the house hollering at the top of her alone. Mary, Mary, get out here right now and embarrass her in front of family and friends. <clears throat> she knows the pain Mary is going through and she goes to her discreetly and quietly and says, Mary, the teacher's here. He wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to you. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Evidently not. I'm not getting a response here. Okay. Verse 29. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now notice this response. Verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where uh, Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out they followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there therefore when Mary came where Jesus was she saw him and what did she do fell at his feet then, this is interesting Martha jumps up in his face confronts him. Mary doesn't have the strength to do it. So what does she do? She just collapses at his feet. This is what's interesting. One stood up to him eye to eye. One fell at his feet. But they both have the same thing to say to him. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Now this shows us. Now the, the point of the scripture is to show us that Jesus is the son of God. He is God incarnate. God in human flesh. He has two natures living in one body. The divine nature and the human nature. And here we see the Son of God, and yet his humanity is not hindered or stopped or made less effective. We see the humanness of Jesus here. We see the humanness of Jesus here. He's not some stoic, cold, unsympathetic someone, but he was deeply moved and he's troubled. Why? Because he sees her tears. And from time to time, we need to be reminded, God sees your tears. He hears your, your soft cry. He knows when you are greatly, greatly upset. More than aware of that. More than aware of that. Verse 34. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Once again, shortest verse in the Bible, but it speaks volumes. What does Jesus do? Jesus openly weeps. Openly weeps. Jesus was a man acquainted with tears on many occasions. And you know, the question has often come up, why exactly is Jesus crying? The Bible does not give us a specific, a specific, but from the earlier signs, we are told that this Jesus was in the beginning, the word was what? God and the word was with God and John is telling us standing outside this tomb 
weeping where there's a dead body of a man he loved stands the creator of all the world. The creator God is standing in this cemetery area looking at a dead man listening to his grieving sisters and family. And I can't prove this, but I've often wondered if Jesus, his tears were a reflection of the creator God who created man in his image to glorify him and to spend eternity for him looking at this situation and say, you know, it won't supposed to be this way. Sin was not in the original plan. Being separated from God was not in our design. And I look at the potential of a human life that glorifies God and can have eternal life. And I compare it to a dead body in a grave. This ain't supposed to be. You know, how many times have you shed a tear or broke down emotionally uh, we should not have to collect items for an orphanage God did not create children to have to grow up in an orphanage did he no and we look at our world we see so many things, so many things. An 18-year-old is shot in Sampson County yesterday and dies. That ain't supposed to be. That ain't supposed to be. But it is. But it is. And this verse reminds us that our Savior came to a world that was lost. And he sees and he understands all of it. He sees and he understands all of it. All right, verse 36. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept him also from dying. Verse 38. So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time, notice the reality here. Lord, by this time, there'll be such a stench. He's been dead four days. Are we ready for this? Verse 40. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see what? Amen. The glory of God. Verse 41. So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes. He's praying, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that what? They may believe that you sent me. The gospel's on full display. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Notice, I won't spend too much time on this, but notice he specifically calls for Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings. His face was wrapped around with a cloth. I love these words. Jesus said to him, unbind him. Let him go. Let him go. And therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done, what? Believed in him. Right, hang on right there for a second. And we're going to come to this crux. All this was orchestrated the way it was. 
Because this was the way to prove without a shadow of doubt that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Send it to the world. Save that which was lost. And he does it in this fashion where Jesus does it so that he is praying to the Father and demonstrating to all that his words are real and powerful and they witness Lazarus being raised from the dead. And the result in this is what? They believed. They believed. All right, this word gets a little interesting. Verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore, the chief priests, Pharisees, convened the council and were saying, What are we doing? For well, this man is performing many signs. Now this is where it gets interesting and confusing at the same time. The chief priest, Pharisees, who know the scriptures, who knows what the scripture says about the one who would come to them who would be the Messiah. They are openly acknowledging this meeting. He's doing all the things. Messiah does. But yet, their unbelief, their unbelief will not let them acknowledge this. Verse 48. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, they, they put a strong, strong spin on this. Strong spin on this. They lose sight of who they are. They are the religious leaders of Israel. And here's the man who's demonstrated that he has the power over death and the power to give eternal life. But they're looking at their power. And if they let this go unchecked, we're out of a job. We're out of our cushy salaries. We're out of all the things that we've built up for ourselves. And then they, they have put a strong stretch on it. And uh, if, if we don't do something, the Romans are going to come in here and they're going to wipe us out. They don't know the prophecy of their own words. They don't know the prophecy of their own words. Number one, their words betray them because they're saying our security lies in us appeasing the Romans. Instead of saying our security comes from us obeying God. And some 40 years later after this event what they said came true the Romans came and they walked them off the map they came and they did that alright verse 49 but one of them Caiaphas who was high priest that year said to them you know nothing at all nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and the whole nation not perish. Wow! Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. They thought he should die to save their temporary nation, but they speak a great truth of God. In order for you and I to have eternal life, this man had to die. But they don't understand the spiritual, scriptural implications of this. They see only the political. This man needs to die to save our debts. Not this man needs to die to save the world from its sin. Verse 52. And not of this nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God 
who are scattered abroad. Keep uh, scrolling, please, sir. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. We'll stop right there. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? As, like I said a little earlier, two groups of people looking at the same situation but responding totally differently. Totally differently. And Jesus shows that those who believe in him, not even death will stop them from living. And the religious leaders, because of their unbelief, cannot see what's happening right in front of them and their own words betray them. The power to believe, to hear the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word, to have it affirmed and to confirm within us by the workings and the leadings of the Holy Spirit, is a marvelous gift. For it is not based on human intellect, or how smart you are, or how much education you have, or any of those things. The ability to recognize that Jesus is the Son of God is a gift of God that He shows us. We didn't figure that out ourselves. And He shows us, and we respond with. God, I believe. Powerful, powerful gift of God. But on the other hand, on the other hand, how devastating, how absolutely devastating is the power of unbelief. The power of unbelief. There are those who have closed their hearts, closed their minds to the message of John's gospel. These things are written that by believing in his name you have eternal life. They have so closed their minds and hearts to that that the power of unbelief will not let them see what's happening right in front of them right in front of them. There's a parable Jesus told about two fellows. One's name was, uniquely enough, Lazarus. And another man was simply called the rich man. And death came to both of them, right? And where did Lazarus go after his death? Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. Paradise. Where did the rich man go? Not to Abraham's bosom. He went to torment. He went to Hades. And remember that unique situation that they could see one another, but there was a great gulf between them so fixed that you couldn't transverse from one side to the other. But the man in Hades could see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. That rich man had a request to Father Abraham. You remember that request? Let somebody come back from the dead to warn my brothers that they won't wind up here. What did Father Abraham tell him? That even if one were to come back from the dead, some still wouldn't believe. That took place the day Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. There were people who saw with their own eyes the miracle power of God of bringing a man out of the grave back to life. But because of their unbelief, they were not convinced, even having seen a dead man come back to life. Oftentimes, I've told myself, you know, God, I just, I just wish certain people could witness for themselves certain events, thinking it would change them. And it might. But even in this story, where unbelief is so, so set up, so, so ensconced, 
Things that you think would shake people up. Things that would shake people up to their very core. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You know, I've, I've heard this expression. I know you have too. I, people said, I have seen something and you won't know. I'll never get over it. But that's not true. That is not true. But John shows us that all that we know of the scriptures is to lead us to the point that we are tonight where we say, we believe. We believe. Even when we stand up into a world that says we refuse to believe. We refuse to believe. Now we need to look at our, our prayer list tonight. I um, want to share with you a couple of uh, encouraging news. Edna Barefoot had her surgery yesterday where they inserted the steel rod into her leg. She came through that and did wonderfully, which is no small accomplishment. And my understanding, and that also Pastor Lewis, uh, in talking to Crystal, it is now uh, trying to be determined whether they can bring her back home or if they have to go into a hospice center. But Edna is in hospice. She will be going into a hospice situation, whether that be at her home or in some center. They're trying to... Uh, <coughs> come up with the best solution for that. Uh, they need your prayers in that. And talk about miraculous. I am thrilled to share with you tonight that uh, Kathy Baker had the surgery and they removed the blood clot and other uh, tissues from around her lung. And she came out of that, which is nothing short of a miracle in my book. Uh, and let me say this right, right off the bat. I'm having senior moments and folks have had to stop me because I meant to say Kathy Baker and I said Becky Baker and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, yeah, thank you for correcting me. So if I misspoke and said Becky, I'm talking about <coughs> Kathy. But uh, she's still not out of the woods. She has the inflammation around the uh, sack of water around her heart that they've got to deal with. So uh, let's continue to hold them up tomorrow. Julie Autry will have the surgery to deal with the aortic valve at Rex in Raleigh. Also a very, very complicated and dangerous surgery. So we need to continue to lift up uh, Julie. Uh, we continue to lift up uh, Dean and Gloria Carroll, Stephanie Barefoot, Christy Bell, uh, Lori Fowler and her mom and dad, Terry Frost, and uh, my sister Cheryl Gallagher, Buddy Godfrey, Marty Hayes, little uh, Chancy, uh, Jeanette Hudson, and J.W. Jackson, uh, Ruthie Jackson, Nicholas Lejeune, uh, Barbara Lewis, uh, continue to pray for Reed. He is coming home tomorrow. Thank God he's coming home tomorrow. Thank you for your support. Uh, been made aware that Dickie Pope is back in the hospital. I assume that's at Betsy Johnson. So let's remember uh, Dickie and Doris, Sandra Rivenbart, our brother Ray Smith, and uh, continue to remember uh, Pastor Lewis's wife, Miss Cheryl, uh, Judy Talton, um, Jeff, uh, and Ellen. Ellen sent me a text today. Jeff's mother, Judy, her blood pressure was bottoming out today, and they had to remove her from the uh, center to from rehab to the hospital. She is improving, she is responding, but she needs our prayer. So uh, Jeff and Ellen want us to be remembering uh, their mom, Judy, tonight, Gail Taylor, Al Tripp, uh, Linda Turlington, Terry Wagner, continue to lift up Mary Beverly and uh, Betsy. Kenny Edwards is back home from the hospital. We have added uh, to our list tonight, uh, Sylvia Ganey, uh, Mr. Ganey's uh, uh, widow. Also, we've been asked to pray for Greg Wise, who's with the Hare and Fire Department, and uh, my neighbor down the street. Many of you may know Jart Hudson, uh, does farming. Jart got some devastating news. Uh, he doesn't have many days left. Uh, evidently, he has 
uh, been engulfed in cancer. I don't know all the details, but uh, he's been sent home to get his affairs in order. So pray for Jart, J-R, pardon me, J-A-R-T, Jart Hudson, and to, uh, to lift him up. So we're praying for these. And we continue to pray for our homebound, Mr. Sonny, Miss Carolyn, praying for Boogie and Betty. And let me say this, let me remind the men, we're going to meet here Saturday morning at 730. And we're going over to Betty and Boogie's. We've got some work we need to do over at their place. So, men, we're going to be here Saturday morning at 730. Then we're going over to uh, Left Lane and Boogie's house. Sylva, we're praying for you, darling. We're praying for you and Wanda. And uh, we're praying for Hazel and Melody and Miss Louise Vaughn. I kicked myself. I meant to mention this. I did not. But we need to pray tonight, obviously, for the situation in the Middle East with Israel and Iran. So please continue to pray for this situation. Uh, you're talking about the hand of God. My uh, former church member, I've told you about her before, uh, Callie Mitchell lives in Jerusalem. She talked about those uh, rockets coming in from Iran. And uh, amazingly, only one child was injured and that's from where they destroy the missiles overhead and metal and stuff fall down to it. Uh, a child was injured, I understand. But I haven't heard of any deaths. But uh, it's, a, it's a powder keg of a situation as it always is. So let's uh, hold those up tonight. Others we need to remember. Let's pray together now. Pastor Lewis, would you lead us as we pray, please, sir? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful for this opportunity to be here tonight. And we ask your blessing to be upon all that I mentioned. We have a long, long list. We just ask you to be with our world, be with Israel. Be with the whole area over there. Keep your shield protection upon them. Be also with those who will be dealing with hospice. Be with those who will be dealing with further surgery. And Lord, we just lift up all of these to you tonight. We ask that you be with the very minister of the church, be with our pastor and his family, and just watch over all of us. We ask that you bless us and give us traveling mercies as we go to our houses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thank you all tonight.